So this is the first lecture on attacks. So here we're gonna see how we can compute the discrete log problem. In the last lecture I was motivating the relationship between those problems and saying, okay, we actually sometimes care about DDHP and CDHP, but in the end what the Cook analysts, what we study is, well, how to solve the discrete log problem. So let me set the notation here a little bit. Um, so we're gonna work in some cyclic group generated by some point P, and well, we call n the number of elements. And because we've been doing a lot of the curve cryptography, I'm talking about an additively written group here. So we're gonna have some target R, that was the P sub A before, but then I'm having to win subscripts here, so it's not really R, and we know P, and we know how to compute in G. So we're trying to find out what A was used in order to compute A, uh, R. So R is A times P, or a is known as the discrete logarithm of, a, uh, of R to the base of P. So P is the base point, R is a multiple of this base point, and we want to find out this A. So I'm saying, okay, it's a cyclic group, and so such an A exists. If you're taking random elements from a group, then, well, it need not exist, but we're taking uh, R to be multiple or sampled randomly from this group, which is generated by P. So if we have an elliptic curve group over Fp, then we haven't seen that, um, but point counting runs in time that is polynomial in the bit length, so polynomial in log of p. And then the number of points, I said in a previous lecture that it's about p plus 1, here is in more precise statements in the Hasse interval, so it's centered at p plus 1, and at the lower end it's p plus 1 minus 2 squared of p, on the upper end, it's p plus 1 plus square root. Now, for p being a prime, this square root is not an integer, so the extremal values can't happen, but it's an integer within that interval. And also for the group structure, so if you're looking at all points on the elliptic curve, then it can actually be a product of two groups. Um, if you're uncomfortable with those things, you won't actually need much of this group structure. But if you're a mathematician, then yes, you should totally know that um, picking a random point will not necessarily land inside this group because you might be in something which is not generated by P. So these uh, parts are somewhat restrictive. So there's a big cyclic group of order n, and then there's a smaller cyclic part of order m, where m has to be a divisor of n, and it has to be a divisor of p minus 1. So we have a characteristic as p, and then m has to be a divisor of p minus 1. And so depending on how p minus 1 factors, this very strongly limits it. And for crypto, we want to work in the z mod n part in the large subgroup, and we're actually going to see a motivation why we want to work in even a smaller subgroup, namely on something where the point p generates a group of order that is a prime. As our running example, which, by what I just said, will be a very bad example, uh, we can look at this curve. And for attacks, I'm going to use Weierstrass curves, not just because adverse curves are so nice you can't possibly attack them. Well, you know, they are by rational equivalent, so if you can break one, you can break the other. By rational equivalence means you can move over group order, so if you can compute A on the Weierstrass curve, you can compute A on the Edwards curve. It's the same A. Um, but actually we'll notice that Weierstrass curves are better for computing attacks because those will have to be in affine coordinates. We've just seen by, uh, Edwards coordinates with projective coordinates and Montgomery curves with projective coordinates. And for these attacks, we want to use affine coordinates. And there Weierstrass is faster. For projective, it's slower. Okay, you now had some time to look at this curve. It's y squared equals x cubed minus, one, minus x. Um, okay, it's a little bit short if you now brute force in the number of points. You can actually think a little bit about this is a prime, which is 3 mod 4, so minus 1 is not a square in there. And if you think hard enough, you'll find out that we have an interesting map so that for each x coordinate we have a y. And that, well, we have this point in infinity as well. And so we're going to get exactly p plus 1, namely a million 4 points. And a million four factors apart. So, as I said, it's not going to be a good curve. It's going to be a great curve for demonstrating all the attacks. So this is 
please not a curve to use in practice. All the properties you're going to see are weaker than they could be. Also, it's a way too small prime. But it's a prime I can easily work with on slides. And okay, I can find a point of order, not quite a four group or a million four, but half of that. So fairly likely, well, could have just not switched long enough, but fairly likely we actually have this case that we have z mod 2 times 500,002. So that there's this extra factor 2, which I can't actually get as part of my big cyclic group as an extra cofactor 2, which, well, I can't use. But I have a point B of a pretty large order. And then, well, somewhere within that time, uh, within that range, there is a A which I use to compute this multiple there. So my super secret A went into computing this target point. So A times P, this number there, 670,366, and whatever y coordinate, that is a multiple of this base point. Um, so it's a multiple of P, I promise you that, so it's an element of the cyclic group. And then, well, you get the task to compute a discrete log, you can solve it by brute force. And maybe you have by now solved the example of the clock group by brute force. Well, if you haven't done a brute force attack, let's see what it does. It takes P. It takes 2P. It takes 3P. It takes 4P. Okay, I'm not going to spend the whole uh, lecture on, on running through those. Eventually, we'll have reached um, 500,001P. Now, two things to notice. So, if you look at the coordinates, then the X coordinate of this 500,001 is exactly the same as the X coordinate of P. The Y coordinate is different, and if you add those two Y coordinates, you're actually getting a million three, meaning that these Y coordinates are each other's negative. So that is what we had on Weierstrass curves, that the negative of a point has the same X coordinate and the negative of the Y coordinate. And that makes sense, because the point has order a million and uh, 500,002. So 500,002 times P is infinity. And then one step before that, well, that is exactly before we add P another time, we get to infinity. So that must be the negative of P. It's another proof that the order is that, is that number if you have not encountered infinity on the curve. And somewhere on this, I'm not going to give away yet, where you will have run through my public key. Now, what's the worst case? The worst case, if you really run all the way to 500,002, could stop two steps earlier, it would be 5001. And I always see your brains going like, okay, you can say factor of two by observing that the x coordinates would be the same as the target point, so you only have to search the first half. Yeah, okay, we're gonna get there and gonna see some of those savings. Um, I actually want to get you into some other direction. I want to see like how long it will take till you find something. So this is only relevant if brute force attacks are the best thing we can do. So we're actually going to see faster attacks on the curve and that the following things will not have the same numbers. But for a brute force attack, it is correct that if we, well, take up to the maximum steps in general, but we can get lucky earlier. For instance, well, we're looking at this interval of length n. You have a 50-50 chance of landing in either half. So with half chance or 50% chance you're actually done after group or divided by 2 cost. And I'm sparing myself the, the floor so n might be not even in this case, it is even, but it's like roughly half the time for 50, about 50% 50 chance. Or if we're looking at finite choppings of the interval, say 10 pieces, well the interval, uh, the discrete log is somewhere in that and with one tenth probabilities in the first part. So with one tenth chance, I'll be done after just a tenth of the computation. Now you might go like, haha, I'm a smart person. I have just realized that I'm much, much safer if I choose a large secret key. So if I choose my A to be large, then this brute force attack won't get to me. But, well, you know, the attacker has thought about it. The attacker can actually use something which is called random self-reduction. That means you can move around uh, with a discrete log problem, and if I assume that you have done something weird like this, I would just take 
your public key, this a times p, and pick a random r somewhere from this interval, compute r times p, and then I can just get a plus r times p by summing up your public key and this thing that I just computed. Okay, so this will have shifted this scalar, whether the a was here or there or there, will have shifted it by r. Okay, so I can get, first of all, I can get the discrete log a by subtracting r from this number that I'm getting, and also it has moved it around. So in my example, if I'm picking 69,961, then I compute r times p. At some point there, it's just another scalar multiplication. We learned how to do this efficiently. And then it's one addition, and we get our new target. Now, this target will be just somewhere. And maybe your key was small, maybe your key was big, but this has randomized the position. Now, another interesting thing, and again, let me highlight that this is only for brute force attacks, um, is if you have multiple targets. So if you have a hundred people you attack, let's say you're the NSA or some other government agency, where you have hundred interesting people, and, well, you want to break all of them. The search that I've just been doing, the running through P, 2P, 3P, 4P, whoop, and so on, well, it not only runs through Alice's keys, but also through Bob's keys, Charlie's keys, and so on. So all hundred targets will be done at that point. Because you're running deterministically through all possible keys, all possible secret keys, and so you will encounter all possible public keys. So if you want to do it efficiently, say, you at some point find yourself in a situation that you need to break lots of keys, and unlike with elliptic curves, you actually are in a crypto system like symmetric crypto systems, where brute force search is the best you can do, then you would be going for something which is including all the keys, everything that belongs to the keys, sort that so they have an easy way of looking it up, and then checking, well, when you're running through those steps, do I encounter one of the targets? And, well, the table is solid, but there should be an argument which tells you, uh, I mean, you, you then find that that's the A, and so you're like, okay, this was Alice, or this was Bob, or this was Charlie. Okay, so we learned that, okay, we can break 100 keys about the cost of solving one. So, okay, the worst case cost for one is running through all of those. The worst case cost for breaking all 100 is also running through all of them. The best case or the average case is, okay, then if you would be in the first 10, you would break the first, but maybe the last one is the last 10. So, but for averages, this was pretty good. Also interesting, like you're attacking a group of people who've been talking to one another and you expect that each of them has the same interesting information. So you don't actually care which one you're breaking. Well, that's not so much an example for the NSA, that's maybe more if you're out for gain and profit and you have found a hundred users who all have an interesting bank account or interesting Bitcoin uh, signature and you happen to have the public keys. I know I'm getting here uh, less realistic, but enough people don't actually change the public keys. So you have a hundred targets and each of those are filthy rich. So any of them would be worth a target, so solving at least one of them, well, if there are 100 of them, they are randomly distributed over this interval. The first one you're getting by running through it deterministically is probably in the first 100s. And the second one is after that. Now those are averages, it could be later, it could be sooner, it could be two already in the first 100, but on average, by having 100 targets, you're saving yourself a factor of 100 if you only need to solve one. So important, there's a difference between the first one and the second one. The first one wants to solve all 100, and the second one wants to solve at least one. So both of those are interesting targets in cryptography, depending on the use case. And okay, in the end, of course, we're designing our systems such that neither of them can be broken. Which also tells you that, well, the group order has to be sufficiently large that just adding a few targets doesn't help. Now, there's an interesting thing about this. We have now seen that breaking one out of a hundred is faster than solving one. Is that actually true? I mean, can't we bootstrap from that to something better 
also for one target. And yes, I would speak like this if it was impossible, so we can turn our one discrete log problem into a hundred to benefit from this randomization. And it's going to be actually in some sense better because it's less random, you have a good chance, well, you know it's going to be somewhere sooner. Because what I'm going to do is I take my full interval, I take a hundredth of it, so I know now it moves me from here to there to there to there. And well, since it's more to the group order, I mean, this is n, and if you get to n times p, you hit infinity, n plus 1 times p is p again. So actually the interval that this is in wraps around. So if I reach the far end, I will come back. So if I now take my target, this is a times p, and then add m times p to it, so m is this n divided by 100 times p, then I'm moving between a partition of this interval into 100 pieces. And well, no matter where a was at the beginning, one of those is going to be in the first 100. So I'm actually saving a factor 100 by, well, I have to put a little effort into it. I have to compute my 100 targets. But computing the targets is, is really, really small compared to running through this whole interval. I mean, that's 100 compared to 500,002. So I'm really saving a factor of 100 plus or minus 10. And I mean, also, it could be in the first 50, right? So most of these are averages, but I know there's going to be one of these in the first 100. And so, well, maybe I can save a factor 200, 300, 400, 1,000. Well, uh, actually, wait a second. What I just said about the cost of setting things up, the cost of doing 100 of these additions, at some point, I have to think for a moment where this will be, but at some point the cost of setting up the targets will be more expensive than this n over whatever number of targets of additions. Since I'm looking at something which is about the size of a million, this will be at the latest at a thousand. So in general, I cannot save more than a scroll of a group order. Because else, this first part where I'm computing all the targets will be the dominant part of the cost. And then the brute force search through, well, that we do for the extreme case, if I would have 100,000 targets, then I would only have to do five steps to search all of them. That would be pretty ridiculous. So balancing those things would be a scroll of it. And that's actually all we need to understand in order to come up with an attack which runs faster than this brute force attack. I promised you that for Lopte Curse, um, brute force attacks are not the best we can do. And here we go, the baby step giants step out of it. So this is really just systematizing and optimizing exactly this approach. We're gonna get, take our one target and turn it into a lot of targets, but not more targets than is useful. And I was saying before also like we're guaranteed to have the first hundred contain one of the targets. So let's also systematize this. Alright, so our A is the target we're looking for. And then I'm gonna have this M. This was this well n over hundred or n over two hundred or whatever this extra partition that I'm using. And I can write A in base M. That means I'm taking A equals A0, which is well, a mod m, and then whatever multiple of m I need in order to get to m. And then a0 is between 0 and m, and a1 is large enough so that I can get the whole range till m. And so that means n divided by m plus 1. Because typically, well, n we want as a prime group order, so m will not be a divisor, but so it's in that range. And then I'm going to compute all these small pieces. So I'm actually going to reverse the order of what I've been doing. On the previous page with the multiple targets, I set up my targets first and then did a small brute force switch through the size of the interval. I mean, not so small because I mean, the interval is a hundredth or two hundredth of the full size. Now I'm going to do this part first. I'm going to do write all the numbers 0 times p, 1 times p, 2 times p, till 
well, m minus 1 times p. Those are my possible a0 times p. And deterministically, this costs me m steps and m space. And there's actually a benefit of doing it in this order. Namely, at the end of this, I'm having m minus 1 times p. And, well, if you remember what I needed for setting up my targets, that was m times p. So it's just one more addition to get m times p. Okay. And then, since I have a written as a0 times uh, plus m times a, I can sort this around. So I'm now having the a times p0, uh, a0 times p on one side, and the target minus a times mp on the other side. Okay, so it's slightly different from what I had on the previous page, in that I have a minus instead of a plus. So instead of adding m times p, I'm adding minus m times p. But remember, we are on elliptic curves, and so taking the negative of a point is just flipping the sign on the whiteboard. So this doesn't actually cost me anything. Like, have computed m times p, I compute just the negative of the y coordinate, and then I have minus m times p. Okay, and this is what we call the giant steps. The beta steps are like this part, which is doing one p at a time, so very small steps. This is doing m times p, much, much bigger steps at a time. So these are the giant steps. So we pre-compute the baby steps, we then compute the giant steps, and so then we find a match, and because a1 is this interval, we need most n over to m plus 1 steps. So we're guaranteed to find a match after that many. Now, with the example where I did a, something on the scale of a million going to up to a thousand, we have already seen that it does, there's no point in going beyond the square root of n. But up to a square root of n, it actually gets cheaper. So if we pick m to be, well, the square root of n, then I would use the floor of that, then we have square root of n slightly less, and square root of n slightly more for the a1. So both of those, the baby steps cost square root of n, the giant step in the worst case cost square root of n, and then there's some small constants that come in. But I mean, since we have the negative thing, it's, it's really minimal. So the cost, the total cost, is O of square root of n. We also have square root of n in storage because we need to compute all these baby steps. All the m different, so m different steps at the beginning, we need to pre compute and we need to check when we get the targets whether any of them match. Now, this algorithm um, doesn't use anything specific of elliptic curves. Well, there's a tiny little bit which I'm using that the negative of a point is very easy to compute. But in any group, you have an inverse. I mean, it wouldn't be a group if there wasn't a concept of inverse. And so the equivalent of adding minus np will require an inversion in the group. Here, inversion is just gave integration because it's additively written. So that's the only possible place which is sort of expensive in addition to something. But this is fully generic. So as soon as you work in a group, so discrete log problem is defined over group, so as soon as you work in a discrete log problem, you will have a baby step giant step attack. So the security of the discrete log problem cannot be harder than the square root of the group order. So the best we can hope for in our example is square root of 500,002. We will actually see that it's much, much lower, but for well-chosen groups, and the purpose of seeing all the attacks is to figure out what it means to be well-chosen, for well-chosen group, um, this will be also about the best attack cost. That's it. Thanks.